Welcome to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, brought to you by the experts at Maryfield Garden Center. Join us as we discover beautiful plants, new trends, and exciting ideas for your landscape. So let's get growing together. Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, bringing out the best in your garden. Hello everybody, so glad you could be here with us this morning, spend a little part of your weekend with us. I'm Debbie Warhurst Cap, along with David Yost. How are you this morning? I'm doing just great. How about yourself, I'm Debbie? I'm great. I'm great. A little chilly, but you know, we're, we've gotten used to that. Yeah, exactly. It seems almost becoming normal to I wake know. up and be 12 degrees really? or something out. <laughs> right. Well, this is the chilly time of year, but there are certain things you can do inside over the winter time, gardening-wise. And uh, David, you're going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about one of my favorite parts of gardening, and that's what we're calling it getting started with seeds, mm -hmm. uh, growing plants from seed. Uh, I know many of us uh, go out and just purchase plants and let somebody else do that part of the job for us, and that's fine. We want you to do that. But if you're willing to put a little time and effort into producing your own plants, it can be a really rewarding mm -hmm. experience. Uh, uh, it's just you know so much fun to do this and we'll talk about some of the other advantages you have in terms of selection uh, all the different varieties you have and mostly it's just a kind of a hobbyist right. thing to do. Well and it's a great thing to do with the kids too. Yeah, Absolutely to those, especially when involved. they're stuck inside because exactly. it's so cold outside <laughs> it gives them something to do also. That's for sure. Before we get started just a couple of quick announcements. Our seminars got off to a great start last week. We were so thrilled with, with the response and hope you enjoy them as well. We've got three more this weekend. Uh, so you have, to, you have to choose. That's the only, the only downside to this at all is that there's so many great topics you have to choose. So at our Maryfield location today, actually at the Maryfield Community Hall, which is right next door to our Maryfield location uh, on Lee Highway and Gallows Road, Color and Interest in the Winter Garden. And Michael Fay is going to be doing that. And he's got some great ideas to share with you. That's at 10 a.m. at the Maryfield location. At our Fair Oaks location, how to be a successful gardener. My dad, Bob Warhurst, is going to be doing this. Now, if you've, he's done this a few times, and it's a, it's a great seminar, so if you have not seen this yet, you need to come by today and take advantage of this, because he's got some great ideas. He's been doing this for 40, Three, forty-four years. Yeah. <laughs> so he he's done a lot of research and a lot of practice over the years. Yeah, and basically, you know, we're trying to say gardening's not complicated. That's right. You know, it's just you get the basics right. You know, and you're almost guaranteed success. So Absolutely. I know a lot of that. What he is really trying to say is, we want your plants to live. We want them to thrive. And if you follow his, uh, your father's simple instructions, mm -hmm. it will work for you. It's great. So that's at 10 a.m. at our Fair Oaks location. At our Gainesville location, Chuck Croft is going to be there. He's with the Northern Virginia Bonsai Society, so we're so grateful for, to him for coming today. He's going to be talking about bonsai for beginners, and he gives a great presentation. You've seen that before. Oh, yeah. Now, Chuck, like I say, he's a, he's a master at growing bonsai, mm -hmm. and he's exhibited you know, nationally and won awards and everything like that. Uh, but it's kind of neat that he's going out there and really targeting towards beginners. Mm -hmm. um, now, I would have to think even if you're experienced, you would gain some benefit from it but again that's uh, one of these little niche parts of gardening sort of a specialty aspect but uh, it's so rewarding and so enjoyable you know if you decide you want to uh, pursue those type of interests absolutely if you haven't picked up the entire schedule and they go at all three locations through March and then through April at our Gainesville location stop by our stores pick up the uh, the booklet the seminar booklet or you can go to our website maryfieldgardencenter.com we've got three more next week uh, give you just a Heads up on that. House plants, 50 plants I can't live without. I'll let you think about that topic. And garden design. So, again, our website has the entire uh, seminar schedule listed. It's easy to pop right on there at maryfieldgardencenter.com. Uh, also, if you're on Facebook, we, if you're if you like us, I guess, on Facebook, usually every Friday, Thursday or Friday, we post what the seminars are going to be this, this weekend. So join us on there if you haven't as yet. Exactly. It's too cold to be outside gardening, so right. come on into the seminars, and that's a great way to, to be inside and comfortable and learn more. So shall we get started? Absolutely. Well, I want to talk about with um, as far as growing plants from seed or developing probably the most common problem I see or the biggest mistake that I see is on the timing of right. when to actually get started. And so that's where I sort of want to begin this topic. And it's really based around what we call the average frost dates or the, the average last killing frost in spring. And what will happen, that exact date varies from location to location and year to year. So I just put up there a map of Virginia as well as the national map. 
But what we're what they're trying to say is um, so where where our garden center is located, where I live, in an average year, the last killing frost is somewhere between April 20 and April 30. Uh, now that doesn't mean that you're completely free of any risk of right. frost. That means if I put my plants out on April 1, chances are I'm going to get a frost, mm -hmm. and if they're sensitive to the frost, they're going to be damaged or killed. Right. If I put them out, if I wait till after April 20, then my odds increase to sort of like 50-50. Mm -hmm. If I really want to be completely at risk free, I'm going to have to wait until way into May, because right. you know, we can have frost even up to Mother's Day. <clears throat> so I'm emphasizing this because this is based around when the plants go outside. Right. So to figure out when to do your planting, when you're going to sow the seeds, you have to first determine where that frost date is. You're trying to set that target date to when they're going outside, mm -hmm. and then count backwards from there a certain number of weeks. That's easy for some people to do, and not for some yeah. interrupts. <laughs> you know, it really is that easy for anybody because what you'll yeah. find is on these seed packages, on all the seed packages on the back, on the instructions, they will tell you how many weeks to wait. Do I start? four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, or ten weeks before right. frost, and that's going to term, determine your planting date. So one of the things, if you do this, it's really too early now in January right. to be doing your seeding, but it's the perfect time to be doing your shopping, selecting the seeds, mm -hmm. getting your supplies, planning out what you want to grow, all those kind of things. So that's why we're talking about today. Right. And if you've got different seeds that are at different times, if you get a little chart set up, that's a great way to do yeah, it. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. it certainly is. So that's the idea. Um, you don't want to get ahead of yourself, uh, which is we, what we do because we're inside, is bored, and we plant right. them. They get <laughs> overgrown, and, yeah. and it just goes down from there. So just kind of follow the instructions on the seed package as to when you get started. Mm -hmm. And depending on the plants, I've got a little picture to show you here. These are some tomato seedlings. Uh, these are probably about four weeks old, the seedlings that you see there. Right. Uh, so, you know, it's um, depending on what you're growing, you know, that, that's going to set your determination rates and everything. But uh, you can see it will succeed, mm -hmm. basically, um, and we're going to go through this whole thing in great detail of just how you get started with it. Okay, and the seeds are in. It's, it's so fun to see all the different types of seeds there are. The and I think we're amazing. representing about seven or eight different yeah. vendors this year. That's right. So big selection. Okay, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we've, uh, we've got a, a video for you, so get a little treat, so we'll be right back. Welcome back. During the break, one of our wonderful crew members here suggested we were talking about, you know, when you're starting your seeds that you need to count back and that type of thing. She said, well, you should have told them to get the Maryfield Garden Center calendar and do that. Exactly. So you just mark that. your frost date. That's and right. again, you can look that up on the internet, <laughs> you know, through your local extension service or so that. Mark it on your calendar and then, like I said, count back from there. Perfect. And there's so many tips and, and fun things in here. So we've got plenty left. So just stop on by any of the locations and pick one up. We have a encore performance of a video that David did last year on seed starting. So it was said it all, so we said let's do it again. So let's take a look. Planting seeds and watch them grow and mature into herbs, vegetables, and flowers is just a tremendous experience for everyone. No matter how old you are, watching this happen year after year is just uh, to participate in the wonders and miracles of nature. When you think about taking a seed a little dried up little speck like this tomato seed, planting it and thinking that it's going to grow to my size and give us tomatoes that we can put on the dinner table by the end of the season is just really amazing. This seed has everything it needs in here to produce beautiful fruits. All it really needs is sun, water, and tender loving care, which is of course the role of the gardener. Now, apart from just the sheer fun and enjoyment of growing plants from seeds, one of the main reasons we do this is because it gives us the opportunity to select the varieties of the, exactly the plants that we want. And we have a huge selection that's here. So, for example, if you want to grow seeds for the kitchen, or plants for the kitchen, I should say, uh, we have seeds that are imported from Italy specifically to get that flavor. 
So this is one that's an ox heart type of tomato that I've grown before. It's thick, it's meaty, it's wonderful fresh, great for cooking. Uh, this is one that I'm going to be trying this year. It's a small sweet pepper that's supposed to have very thick, crisp, moist flesh. So we'll find out how that goes. But again, this is the fun part that you have in growing seeds. A lot of people enjoy growing heirloom varieties. These are old varieties that are just passed down from family to family through the generations. There's a lot of interest in this because they have such distinctive colors, shapes, and flavors. So things like this black crim, which is one that I selected and grew last year, it just has such a fresh taste to it. The skin is thin. This is one that doesn't hold up well to shipping. So the only way you're going to get this is if you grow it yourself. At the same time, we carry a full selection of hybrids. There is something to be said for the benefits of hybrid vigor. When you grow ones like this Burpee, uh, Burpee Better Boy, this is one that has the disease resistance, it produces, it's high yielding, a great tomato. So again, the choice is yours that's out there. A lot of people want to grow organic. Um, and you can start even with organic seeds like we have from, from Burpee here with the basil. Nothing can beat just the taste of fresh basil that's in there. So I realize the emphasis I've had here is on vegetables and herbs, but there's a huge selection of flowers, including annuals and perennials. You can pick exactly what colors you want or try some unusual varieties, or there are even these themes like this hummingbird and butterfly garden mixture. So again, the choices just go on and on and on. Now, after you've selected your seeds, you're going to need basic supplies like a seed starter, containers to grow them in, maybe supplemental lights, fertilizers, all the things to get them off to a good, healthy start. So let's go take a look at those. Now that you've selected the seeds that you want to grow, it's time to get started. Now, you could plant them directly in the garden, out in the soil. But a lot of times that means you have to wait until that soil is warm enough to support the plants. So frequently what gardeners like to do is to get started indoors where it's nice, warm, and cozy. If that's what your plan is, then you'll need to begin by getting a good seed starter. Now the seed starter, it's a mix of peat, perlite, and vermiculite. It's been screened to a fine texture, and this gives you the ideal media that will get your plants off to a good, strong beginning. This means that it has that right property to maintain moisture, but also good drainage and aeration for the root development. You'll also need some type of pots or containers to grow your seedlings in. So we have peat pots of different shapes, sizes. There are these plastic inserts that can fit into trays. The selections just go on, on, and on. Now after you've selected your seed starting mix and the different trays or pots that you want to use to grow them in, you may also want to consider looking at one of these heating mats. These heating mats provide a little bit of gentle bottom warmth under the seedlings for enhanced germination. They'll get off to a quicker start, develop a more extensive root system, and get more complete germination going on. Now what's really critical, probably the most important part of this whole process, is your seedlings need good, strong sunlight to grow. If you don't have that available in your home, then you may need to supplement with one of these grow lights. A grow light provides the full spectrum of lights that plants need, all the way from the ultraviolet to infrared. This is really critical to getting your plants stocky and full so they make a good smooth transition out into the garden. So with that, you've got everything you need to get started on a great gardening season. Well, as Debbie had mentioned, we filmed that last year, and each year the seed selection changes a little bit from uh, year to year. So one thing, as I would mentioned there, kind of put an emphasis on those Frankie seeds. They're running a little bit late in their delivery, uh, so we don't have those exact ones in stock today, but we're waiting for them to show up any day now. Plus, we've added a lot of new varieties also to the selection that's there. Now, something I mentioned in there was the importance of lighting. And I feel that any time you're gardening indoors, whether you're just growing a few African violets or you're trying to grow plants from seed, lighting is the limiting factor. And you have lots and lots of choices available to you. Uh, I set this up, uh, this little fluorescent light today, because I think this would be like the ideal setup to use for starting seeds. And I say what they're doing, it's, a, um, it's what's called a compact fluorescent light. And one thing that's nice with this 
is that you can adjust the height on here. So as your plants are growing taller or shorter, uh, clearly you can raise and lower the light that's on here. So that's a real nice feature that this offers. Also with the uh, compact fluorescent lights, uh, they offer this high intensity of light that's in there. Uh, you can see it's not the standard size bulb. This is just the uh, replacement bulb I'm showing you. So it's a smaller, more compact bulb. They're very energy efficient and they're designed specifically with that full spectrum of lighting that your plants need to stay stocky and good and healthy. So you'll want to leave these on if you're growing plants from seed. For the most part, you'll want to leave them on for anywhere from about 12 to 14 hours a day. So it's really convenient to set that on a timer. Perfect for starting seeds. And then when you get out of the seed starting uh, arena, then you could grow different little flowering plants and house plants. So even here you see things like the calanchoe and ivy and primrose and some seasonal color that's in there. So this is a perfect way to um, add that spot of color to your home, get seeds off to good start. This is something you'll get years and years of utility off of it. So you can see us and we've got all kinds of other options as well, compact fluorescent, LED, uh, you know, the, the high intensity ones. And also I want to say this reflector is designed specifically to make the, the uh, light distribute uniformly. So there's a lot of great things about this setup. All right, we're going to take a little quick commercial break right now. When we come back, we're going to continue with more tips on getting plants started from seed. Hi everybody, welcome back. We're talking about getting started with seeds today. And, and as David mentioned, it's still a little early to actually do it, but it's a great time to get prepared for it. Oh, it sure is, exactly. You know, first of all, you gotta think about what do I wanna grow, mm -hmm. you know? And, and even if you don't know, it's come just it's fun to just come in and peruse right. that big selection of oh, seeds. Say, oh, I like this and I like <laughs> that. And that's a good way to, um, to help you get going on that. Right, well, we've given you kind of an overview already. So let's get into the how-to now. Exactly, so are the nuts and bolts on this. Now, first of all, I would say that the germination of seed is really dictated by temperature and moisture. Uh, when you're growing seeds, I emphasize it's a process. It doesn't just sort of happen instantaneously. The, the water has to permeate through that seed coat. Then it triggers the breakdown of enzymes that then initiate the growth of the seed, and it kind of goes on from there. So one of the things that we do is when we recommend using a good seed starter, um, the idea with that seed starter is that it acts almost like a sponge so that mm -hmm. it retains enough moisture to, to keep that environment moist around the seed, right. uh, but at the same time not so wet that it's going to you know, just rot in there. Uh, so I like to really, any of the seed starters are really good, whether you, you know, want to use the Espoma, Jiffy Mix, Pro mm -hmm. Mix, Schultz, you know, they all do a good job for right. you. You know, we've got the organic options as well, if that's important to you. And then in that um, second picture, I was trying to show what I like to do, I always just a little tip, I learned the hard way is I use a mister to do oh, my watering that's on a good there. Idea. Yeah. Because that seed mix, if you take a watering can to it, it exactly, <laughs> it tends to go all over the right. place and everything, and that becomes a real mess and everything. Yeah. So it's something you cheat, check frequently and keep that misted. So if you use your imagination a little bit, um, you know, and I, I do like these trays. You have all these different options that are available to you. Uh, but you can buy these inserts in various different sizes. As you saw in the video, I put it in a nice little tray, fill this with the seed starter, and that way they can grow in individual cells. Mm -hmm. Now there's many different ways to do this. I'm just showing you quickly. This is one that I like. To help keep everything moist, keep it damp, lead to good germination, I also very much like to use one of these humidity domes. Uh, and there again, they're designed to fit over there, which is why it's so convenient. So essentially, you have created your own little mini greenhouse yeah. in this mm -hmm. environment. Uh, so it's ideal, perfect conditions for germination that's in there. As I said, the um, germination of your seed is dictated by both temperature and moisture. If you have seeds that need a little bit warmer environment, you know, like tomatoes and peppers and so on, uh, to, to get off to a good start, this is a nice option to have. Again, we showed a little bit of this in the video, but this is essentially... That would be upside down, wouldn't it? Well, I'm glad somebody's <laughs> paying attention. 
but that's just a little um, warming tray thermostatically controlled that you can put under there mm -hmm. uh, gives you a little bit better enhanced germination right and then super quick I want to just show sort of one more thing uh, that's again these are just options as your plants continue to grow we even sell these larger domes oh, so nice. you can continue to maintain this almost like a little mini greenhouse that's mm -hmm. there this is even ventilated you know you've got a little wow. twisty on top so you can allow ventilation that's in there and this point you know you really do have kind of like that little greenhouse mm -hmm. so again this is fun uh, you can kind of do as much or as little as you want with this right okay mm -hmm. so you put all that together and keeping it moist and we'll go back to some more pictures Okay. See what we Let's got see. first. There we go. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, these are my, um, in this case, my little this tomato like four seedlings. Weeks later, is that right? Exactly. Uh, again, some plants like you know beans and melons and things like that, they may germinate for you in a matter of a few days. Uh, but you figure most of these plants are going to be like 10 to 14 days. Some can even be a little more stubborn than that. So uh, basically, they're sprouting. What you'll see is that first they come up with two uh, cotyledons, or sometimes they're called seedling leaves. The first two leaves really are not true leaves. Uh, those are the cotyledons from the seed, and then they emerge out sort of as your first true pair of leaves. So we go from this, and this is a little baby Brussels sprout to give you an idea, all the way up to then we're looking at a tomato in our next picture. This is, a, you can see it's put on four even starting on its second or its sixth uh, true leaves that are on there. This is a good stage at this age of maturity. It's a good time to transplant. Uh, at this point, we're probably a good eight to 10 weeks into the process. And depending again how you do it, when I say transplant, at that point, you may want to transplant that into a larger pot like we were showing that mm -hmm. picture. Um, if it's warm enough, you might even want to transplant it outside. Now, the first set of leaves that come out, do we leave those on there or should you take those off? They'll eventually just dry up okay. on them by themselves and, and shed off of this. So we leave that on there. Mm -hmm. During this whole phase now, these are little tender babies. You know, right. They've been kept indoors. Uh, you want to just continue to fertilize them. I usually do a very dilute mix. I brought a couple choices in here. Uh, like the C-Mate is an excellent choice, uh, humic acid. and seaweed extracts if you want to go organic uh, you can use anything like this Schultz um, if you know there's a, another option I don't really care so much which fertilizer you use but the idea is to kind of keep it dilute uh, so it's not too strong that you're going to injure those little seedlings keep them growing strong uh, keep the lights on them as they're growing keep them stocky and healthy but then as we start to approach that frost date right and you're thinking about moving them outside it's important that you protect them a little bit. They can't really just pop out from an indoor life to outdoor life. Uh, so we acclimate them, or sometimes this is called hardening off. We mm -hmm. gradually introduce them in there. And there's all different ways to do this. In the picture, this is a little thing that's called a wall of water, which again, is a bit of a novelty. It's been around forever, though. Yes, it has. But I, I put them out there just because it's, it's like a little novelty thing. Mm -hmm. Those are plastic tubes that are filled with water, and essentially that little teepee creates this sheltered environment. Uh, it's taking the warmth of the sun, and it's using that to help warm the soil, and it's sheltering the plants down inside there. So this is a way of creating that little shelter mm -hmm. that's outside. Uh, a lot of times we just take the plants and maybe we put them out there when it's sort of mild, but then Who uh, knows? <laughs> bring them back inside, you know, protect them during the cold weather. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I also want to say quickly here that not all seedlings should be started indoors. Uh, some of them, rather than starting indoors, will do fine if they're planted directly into the soil. This is what we call direct sowing. Uh, saves you this uh, step of transplanting and also those are peas they're putting in there coming straight out of the ground. Some others that I'm going to say probably lend themselves better to direct sowing. I just brought a bunch of samples in here. Things like the uh, poppies and sweet peas and um, even you know soybeans, the list goes on. Love and a mist. There's many of these different seeds that you would be better off putting directly in the soil outdoors when it gets warm enough rather than trying to go through the transplanting just because they don't really transplant all that well. Uh, some of these cool season crops, things like spinach, 
Uh, you could sow them maybe as early as March. They tolerate the cool weather, but they're not going to actually germinate mm -hmm. until we get into but about you're sowing, April. These are the ones you're sowing out, sowing outdoors. Right, that's direct okay. sowing to the mm -hmm. ground. So we've been talking about starting seeds indoors. I'm just emphasizing you can also start your seeds right. directly outdoors, but it's it's a wonderful kind of hobby thing. You just got to learn the process of which ones do cool mm -hmm. weather, which ones take the warm weather, uh, and just go from there. Right. Most of all, enjoy. And I mean, there's a lot of seeds that come in these packets. Do you need to plant all of these seeds? Absolutely not. I know there's this compulsion, it's like you need to do that. Right. But no, I've had very good luck. What I'll do is if I plant, you know, a 25% of the seeds are in this package. Mm -hmm. I'll just take the bag, I put it into a Tupperware type of container, mm -hmm. seal it up there, and usually two, three years, they'll hold up very well. By three years, don't don't waste your time with gotcha. it. Throw them out and get a new batch. And these are all date stamped to tell you when they were produced. Right. And be sure to come by because our p people will are there to help you. I mean, there's lots of questions I'm sure you have. We have handouts there at all three st locations. We have expert advice. So it's a great, great activity. Now, when we come back, we've been talking about seeds, but we've got some plants to talk about, too. Sure do. So stay with us. We'll be right back. talking about seeds and there's the um, number of varieties of seeds are just astronomical. I mean, they're, they're, I love to walk through the store and see how many different varieties there are to choose from. But there are also root crops that we need to address. Exactly. Um, and very economical, I have to say, yes. with seeds mm -hmm. also. It's nice. Uh, but not, you know, actually a lot of plants that you come and purchase are really not produced by seed. Right. What happens, I mean, when you when you get a seed, uh, of course, the, the parent plants, you know, pollinate each other. And then you don't have necessarily guaranteed results that are coming out of there. So there are other ways to propagate plants. We're going to talk a little bit about vegetative propagation. So these are a lot of times called seed potatoes. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, misnomer. it's not <laughs> truly a seed, exactly. Right. The uh, potato is a tuber, it's a modified root that's in there. So when we talk about seed potatoes, these are little tiny potatoes um, that you take and you can cut them like a ones that size, you could cut right. them in half. Mm -hmm. As long as it has what you call an eye or it has a bud on mm -hmm. there, you can plant it, and of course, that grows into a potato plant. And you just it, need one eye? I like to have more than one eye. Now, technically, yes, you only have one eye, but um, I've found out. You do I don't. I don't even cut those. I mean, right, right. quite honestly, you know, I just take the whole potato, you know, and, uh -huh. and stick it in the ground. Mm -hmm. And I do that because you know that grows faster, and right. you know, and. But and those that, are smaller ones. There are bigger. Right. I'm not. I'm not like farming 50 right. acres. So I have to get every little bit out of it, or something right. like that. So you would have the option of cutting that into a section, or just stick mm -hmm. the whole potato in the ground. So you stick that tuber in the ground, and then I've just got a picture of what comes out of there. Okay. Because again, there potatoes are wonderfully fun to grow, uh, even if you're limited on space. And when they, what will happen is when they start to flower. So you would plant potatoes, let's say in March, you know, around St. Mm -hmm. Patrick's Day. Uh, this picture is probably taken around June time period when they start to reach flowering. This is the point at where you would start to harvest what, if you wanted to, you could call what they call new potatoes. Oh, right. They're just mm -hmm. small, immature ones. Or you just leave it alone, re let them reach full maturity, and then you harvest them at the end of summer. Great. So potatoes would be an example of mm -hmm. a tuber or root crop that's in there. Um, now onions are basically those are planted as bulbs. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, interestingly enough, you can grow onions from seeds. You can plant the seed, but it takes longer to develop. And so with uh, our climate and the seasonal change and everything, I prefer just to um, you know, get the onions, the little onion sets or bulbs. Again, plant them sometime around March time period and grow that way. Mm -hmm. So some of this stuff we don't have it in stock yet because right. it's really too, too early, early to plant. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to put it out there. You know, we're talking about growing from seed, mm -hmm. propagating, uh, and just really want to emphasize there are, are other ways to propagate. So probably another couple of weeks before those start yes. to arrive. Yeah, but mm -hmm. we'll get a nice selection of those going as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about um, plants that are grown from seed, but commercially, more and more and more plants are being vegetatively propagated. They're being cloned. This allows them to produce more plants faster, and also it's a guarantee of quality. It's a way of assuring that you're actually getting the same 
exact replica of right. what the parent was. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So I brought this uh, begonia in just as an example to kind of show when they're doing um, most of these things in the they're done almost in a lab setting and it's a, what they call tissue propagation mm -hmm. and they'll just take a tiny tiny little growing point they'll go into what we call the meristem uh, right up here and I, it's let's see let's try, see if we can turn this by a little bit so we can and they could literally here. just go up here and take a little cutting even smaller this and produce thousands of plants out of that. Wow. Mm -hmm. Because under the right conditions, each individual cell is capable of producing an entirely new plant. That's amazing. Now that's not necessarily something you're going to do at home, but that's mm -hmm. how it's done commercially. Gotcha. A lot of times what we're doing is we will propagate from cuttings and the, what works really best is go in and get what I'm going to call a tip cutting. So what I would do is I would go in and again, I'm, I'm just doing this kind of for demonstration. Ideally, you want something that's not flowering because uh, that flower is just taking a little bit of energy out of the growth of it. Oh, so I'm just going to so clean the... So you're taking the, the flowers off. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I'm just cleaning the flowers off. Okay. Uh, and let's say... You just want that stem. Is basically right. what you want. What happens, every place a leaf attaches here, there is a bud under there. So behind this leaf there's a bud, behind this leaf there's a bud, behind this one there's a bud. So behind each one of these there's a bud that's capable of producing roots that are in there. So what I would do at that point basically is dip it in a rooting hormone. Uh, this is optional but it's a good idea. The rooting hormone helps to stimulate the growth and development of roots, helps these buds differentiate into the roots. Mm -hmm. And then this kind of brings us back full circle where we're going to get that. Mm -hmm. the benefit of having our little dome and our little seed starting set up. So you would imagine this is just filled with your seed starter, the rooting hormones in there, that plunks that in there, and boom, that's a great way to start new plants. All right. Now begonias, you can actually even start from an individual leaf. Why am I having trouble <laughs> seeing one day? So what would happen if you looked at an individual leaf now you want to get rid of this petiole. That petiole is not doing you any good. But out of the base of the stem where these veins are coming together, again, you could dip that in a rooting hormone and stick that leaf in there. And that will root. Uh, you could, if you wanted to, with a begonia, and again, all these plants are different, you could take that leaf, cut the petiole off, and I could cut this into what they call wedge cuttings. Cut it up just like a pizza pie. Hmm. And as long as I have some of that base in there, I could stick these into my little propagator. And there would, of course, be soil in there, which so, there is not right now. Oh, yeah, now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm just saying that hey, this is fun. It's, uh, you know, whether you're growing from seed or doing your own cuttings, right. if you get the lights, you get the setup, you can find a lot of use for these. That's great. All right, super information. Thank you so much. We are going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to take your phone calls. Give us a call, 703-387-1046, and we will be right back. Okay, we're taking your phone call, 703-387-1046. If you'd like to give us a call, and David, our first caller is Diana, who's calling from Bowie, Maryland. Hi, Diana. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Uh, sure, how are you today? I'm great. Good. And my question is about the grow tiers. Um, I bought one of those, you know, it's like four shelves. It's right. in my kitchen by a patio door. It gets complete, full afternoon heavy sun. Good. So it, is it overkill if I'm going to put those little, the little trays in? Is it overkill to put the lid on it? Uh, no, it's not overkill, but you do, if you do, you need to pay attention to it because you're right, in that full direct sun, that greenhouse, it will literally start to warm up and you can have the opposite problem of being excessive heat. So it's something that you have to monitor closely and a lot of times what would happen is as you start to see the condensation build up there and you're starting to see it literally just like dripping off the top of the dome, then you have to be around to ventilate it. You need to open it up, you know, let, the, let things dry out a little bit, you know, let a little bit cooler air in there, let's say in midday, and then replace the domes and put it back on there uh, in the evening. So again, it's optional. I'm not saying you have to do it. If you're not around, if you're not going to be there to pamper and babysit and nurture them, maybe you're better off without doing it. 
but your very best results, to get your best results, I'm going to say yes, put the humidity dome on there, but that also means that you need to be around to check on them you know, on a daily basis to open that and ventilate it as needed. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank and you And I so feel much. like the seed starting, they are, they become your babies. Okay, I mean, yeah. you're nurturing because, you know, you're there, you're checking them every day, you're spritzing, <laughs> seeing how it is. You know, we'll keep it warm, but not too warm. So it, it's a time commitment, but it's very rewarding. Great. Thank you so much for the call. Okay, let's see. Our next caller is Anthony, who's calling from Fort Washington. Hi, Anthony. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. What's your question? My question is, um, mid-October, I put down, I aerated and put down seed. And now I wanted to know when can I put down my crabgrass preventer? And once I put down my crabgrass preventer, how long do I have to wait before I can put down some more seed? Okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm hoping we're done with the seeding, Anthony. I'll, I'll give you a couple different ways to deal with this. Uh, the, the short answer is the new seed, the seed you put down in October, when it, after it's been mowed three times, after its third cut, it's well enough established that you can go in and put your crabgrass pre-emergent, you can do weed control, you can treat it like an established lawn, but you would not reseed again until, that, until fall. I mean, most of these products are gonna have about a eight to 12 week waiting time before you can seed again. But that's really, I think, where you would get your best results. Now, there's, um, to complicate things a little bit, if you want to do weed prevention at the same time as seeding, there is a new product out that's called Tenacity uh, that will allow you to do that. Or there's one that's been around for a while, it's called Tupersan, and we'll have both of those available. You can use that to simultaneously do weed prevention and seeding if you feel like that's necessary. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Thank you. That's going to lead me in the right direction yeah. I want for my lawn. I would, I would suggest to try to avoid the reseeding. I'm hoping you have good density, good results, and we can just focus on the weeds and, and do our seeding in the fall. We'll give you much better results. Thank you so very much. All right. Thanks for watching. Great. Our next caller is Gloria, who's calling from Suitland. A lot of Maryland callers today. Hi, Gloria. Good. Hi, how are you? Good, We're and doing you? just great. I'm fine, thank you. Good. I have a question about uh, the crepe myrtle. Mm -hmm. I have one in my backyard, and it doesn't uh, get a lot of sun. And I was wondering, would it be safe to move it to a different location in the yard? Or it doesn't get sun because there are a lot of larger trees back there, and they cover, you know, everything in right. the back during the summertime. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, would it be safe to move that crepe myrtle or just try to cut cut back the trees overhead. How, how long has it been in that location? Uh, about five years. Okay. I would say your best option is to move it. Crepe myrtles are very durable. They respond well to transplanting and they're going to need at least six to eight hours of direct sun for you to get good flowering. So your best option would be sometime this winter and that's anywhere from today uh, but sometime, let's say, before April 1, sometime in the next uh, couple months, you can transplant that out, move it into a good sunny location. You'll also have to realize now, basically, it's a new plant. Once it gets transplanted, you'll have to give a little extra attention to it and the watering through its first summer. But by its second summer, it should be well enough established. Um, it should be just flourishing by that time. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more thing. In that shady area in my back, do you have any suggestions for any other type of um, summer flowers or whatever that could go in a shady area? Ooh, summer flowers in the shade. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I'm sure their answers is just not coming to me right now. Uh, if you're thinking, are you looking for a shrub or more of a tree? Uh, probably a shrub or maybe um, something that grows close to the ground? Yeah, you might want to consider looking at, uh, well, I was going to say the hardy gardenias, but, you know, they do better with a little bit of, um, a little bit of sun on them. I guess I'm kind of drawing a blank right now, but if you uh, give us a call at the garden center, I'm sure that uh, we could come up and answer. It's hard to find flowering shrubs that are going to flourish right. in the shade. Uh, and the ones that we have, azaleas and Pierce japonica and all that, they bloom mostly in spring. Yeah. So I'm just okay. coming up with, I'm sure there's a good answer, but I'm not coming up with it right now. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great weekend. We're going to take a quick break and come back with more of your calls.
Okay, David does not like to be stumped, so he has been sitting here the, during the break, and you have come up with the answer. Of course, and it was so <laughs> obvious. I feel ridiculous for not saying it. Uh, Gloria, summer blooms, shade, it's got to be hydrangeas, yep. and there's several different ones that are out there, lots of choices. So it's like the answer is as plain as the nose of my face. I just drawn a blank. Yeah, exactly, because like, you don't get stumped much, that's no, for sure. But uh, hydrangeas rare. are such a nice addition to yes, the summer oh, garden, are. and so many varieties. So that's why I'd say, Gloria, check those out. And you can use them later in the fall, too, when you dry them. Yes. Yeah, great. All right, yeah. let's see. Our next caller is Yolanda, who's calling from Oxen Hill. Hi, Yolanda. How are you today? Um, I'm fine. Good. Good, Good morning. Do you have a question? Um, yes, I do. Uh, the question is, I have um, a snake plant. Mm -hmm. I've had it for about four years. And I had it in a large pot because there was a lot of different ones. Yes. So I planted them in a big, big pot, and they were doing really well. And they were in the front entrance of a house that we were living in, which got a lot of sun through the front door because it was a glass front door. But now I'm living in an apartment, which I'm in the bottom floor, and it's not a lot of sunlight. So I'm not watering the plant a lot. But I've noticed the root is, is getting moist very moist and it's like it's absorbing water from the bottom and then the top just droops down and it dies so i'm trying to figure out what am i doing wrong that they're they're dying now well let, let me ask how often do you water i know I you said say about every two weeks okay and you're watering from the bottom you said no from the top i pour it in from the top Okay. Uh, basically, I think what you've got going on there is, is a bacterial rot problem. So what happens on that um, uh, Sansevieria, there's, there's sort of a rhizome, uh, an underground stem that's in there. So where you find it soft, where it's soft and, and kind of mushy, uh, you're going to have to get in there with some pruners or a knife or something. Cut those soft kind of infected portions out of there. Just cut it out and throw that away in the trash. So we get back to uh, a healthy, sturdy plant that's there. And then I think you can back off in your watering even further. You could probably go back with that plant and water it about once every four weeks. Uh, keep it a little bit on the drier side and I think that will correct the problem. And that plant will adapt even to dark apartments. Everything's a very versatile plant, um, so, so you might be surprised how vigorously it comes back. But, but begin by cutting out anything that's soft or mushy. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, it'll come back, yeah, and don't be afraid, even if that thing looks scary dry. You know, I've let them go eight weeks between waterings, mm -hmm. but I'm not gonna make that as a recommendation. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna say, let's go four weeks and see how it does. Great, thanks so much, have a wonderful weekend. Okay, let's see, our next caller is Ed, who's calling from Fairfax. Hi, Ed. Good morning. How are Good you? Good morning. Great, right enjoy the show. Great. Enjoy the show. Yeah. Uh, David, I'm going to ask you for a recommendation uh, for a tomato uh, plant that I, tomato plants that I might want to plant this spring. Uh, I'm thinking the better boy, the big boy, is probably the best all around for my area. Uh, and I, I wanted to get that last year. Uh, the plants didn't look healthy enough, so I took a, a plant called Celebrity. And uh, I don't think I want to do that this year. What would be your recommendation for uh, the best tomato plant uh, uh, for this area? Well, of course, the best depends on everybody's taste, what yeah. they're after, that kind of stuff. But from what you're telling me, Ed, I would strongly recommend you try to find one that's called Big Beef. Okay. Uh, Big Beef, it is a burpee hybrid. You know, you've, like you mentioned, just like Big Boy and Better Boy, Celebrity are all burpee hybrids on there. But what I think you'll find with Big Beef, it is a, it's a little bit larger tomato, but it has um, much better flavor, I think, than the Celebrity does. To okay. me, Celebrity, uh, if you like a really mild tomato or what I'd call bland one with no flavor, you know, maybe that's Celebrity. But Big Beef uh, will give you all the qualities of like a better boy, but the fruit's more uniform. It doesn't crack and split. It's a hybrid. It yields quite well. Uh, and you can tell, obviously, I'm a fan of them. Yeah. Okay, well that sounds good. Uh, yeah. uh, I'll keep that in mind. And that's that's really kind of a main season tomato. I, if you have the space, I still like early girl. It's an old variety. It's again burpee hybrid, but for an early tomato, I like to have um, 
early girls one I'm in love with, and then mm -hmm. the uh, Big Beef's a good main season variety. Great. Yeah, you know, it depends on when you look at the plants, you have to look at the health of them, and that's why I picked that other. But uh, that's a good uh, recommendation there. Uh, do I have time for another subject? Real quick, real quick. Okay. okay. Uh, right now, the Helleborus, uh, hopefully we'll see it uh, here coming up, but I want to uh, put that one in my uh, garden. And uh, I I'm just wondering, I have an oak tree in shade, and I think it would fit there, but what I'm concerned about is how does that plant uh, last over the summer? Does it do, do okay in the heat? Does it have to be... Uh, watered quite a bit. Uh, what what do, could you tell me about the Helleborus after it blooms? Well, they will go what I call kind of a summer slump that's in there because no, they don't really like the extreme heat of summer. Uh, so you might see where some its growth stops, it starts to yellow or wither a little bit. But I think you have a good location there. I mean, that's uh, where they do best is putting them in the shade under a tree canopy. So that keeps a little bit of heat off of them. Uh, they're sensitive to wet conditions, uh, but they're surprisingly drought tolerant once they get established. So like any new plant, Ed, you might have to keep it watered sort of its first summer, uh, but once it gets its roots out there and established, you'd be surprised how drought tolerant it is. So they, um, obviously they're, they're evergreen, they might slow down or wither a little bit during the summer. And late winter, I'll trim off any leaves that uh, were damaged through the winter, uh, then they could push up some new growth flower. Very good, low maintenance, reliable perennial. And I think that's a good environment for it. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm gonna go with that then. Okay, thank you uh, for your time, okay? Enjoy okay. the program. Thank, thank you. Thank you, take care. Well, my apologies to Aileen and Ashley who are waiting, we have run out of time. So if you'd stay on the line, Diane will get your name and number and, and if you'd give them a call back, that would be great. Yeah, I gotta run back garden center, I know, you take do. care of the seminar first. That's right, first, so he'll call we'll you after the plan. seminar. So, <laughs> so do come to the seminars at all three locations. Uh, next week, Peg, will be here with David Culp talking about the 50 plants that David can't live without from his book. So hope you have a great week and we will see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.